On behalf of the family, thank you for being here today as we celebrate the life of Donald Roy Dupree. Mr. Donald Roy was born December 10th, 1943 in Cachata, Louisiana and passed from this life February 20th, 2022 at the age of 78. He was preceded in death by his parents, Mercer Britton Dupree Sr. and Nona Atkins Dupree, sisters Sue Ann Morgan, Benny Sewell and Joy Dupree, brothers Mercer B. Dupree Jr. and Terry Wayne Dupree, brothers-in-law Edward Forrest, Philip Morgan, Thurman Sewell, Walter Anderson, and Bill Hart, sister-in-law Barbara C. Dupree. He is survived by his loving wife of 58 years, Joyce Dupree, three children, Penny Dupree Hayes and husband John of Cachata, Reverend Britt Dupree and wife Sharon of Bastrop, Dr. Donya Dupree Bounds and husband Stephen of Kirbyville, Texas, grandsons Ty Hester, Reverend Hayden Dupree and wife Cameron, Reverend Alex Dupree, Alan Michael Mikey Jones, six step-grandsons and five step-great-grandchildren, four brothers, Melvin Buntney Dupree and wife Barbara, Ivy B. Dupree, David Dupree, Randall Pogey Dupree and wife Frida, three sisters, Kathleen Forrest, Trudy Anderson and Beth Hart, a brother-in-law, Ray Penny and wife Brenda, sisters-in-law, Carolyn Dupree, Jeannie Dupree, Bobby Penny Foran and husband Christopher. And as evidenced by the gathering here today, many, many friends. I heard Britt say earlier that the only people that didn't love Mr. Donald Roy were those that had never met him, but I honestly didn't realize that there were any of those. Amen. Everybody knew Donald Roy Dupree. I, I don't remember not knowing DR, not knowing who that was, because his dad and I had graduated high school together, had been lifelong friends, and so he, he was always, that name was uh, always around, and so I don't remember a time in my life when I didn't know of D.R. Dupree, but it was at some point in my life when uh, Penny came into the family and I really got to know Mr. Donald Roy on a personal level, and I want to tell you, he was, uh, he just had a demeanor that uh, the world could stand a lot more of. Amen? He had a presence and a countenance. And, and when I think about Mr. Don, I think about a passage from Galatians 5. It talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And their fruit is singular because it's nine attributes or nine character qualities that all make up the fruit. And it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And even as I go through that list, you can think of Mr. Don and every one of those attributes applies to him. But can I tell you, if you take all nine of those character qualities and you impute them into one man, you get the man, Jesus Christ. And the reason that you saw those qualities born out in the life of Donald Roy Dupree is because he was indwelled by the person of the Spirit of Jesus Christ in whom he had placed his faith and trust. And I know without a doubt, as man of few words he might have been, depending on the situation, that he would tell you today in this hour, at this time, to put your faith and trust in Christ and him alone. This is a day that we all must face. Jesus speaking to his disciples in the 14th chapter of John, said, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And there was one amongst them named John, uh, named Thomas rather, not unlike many of us. And he said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And all the love of a friend, Jesus looked him in the eye and he said, Tom, 
I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father but by or through me. Amen. When Jesus said, I am the way, he was saying there is no other way. That's a definite article. I am the truth. There is no other truth. And I am the life. There is no other life except in Jesus Christ. Amen. Mr. Don, uh, known as Don, Donna Roy, Dr. Papa, Dad, lots of names. And uh, listen, he was good at every role. Amen? Amen. He was good at everything that, that he did. If he wasn't good at it, he didn't do it. But he was good at what he did. And let me tell you, we can have that hope and that comfort today that he is fully and completely healed, that he has entered into that eternal life, not because he was a good dad or a good grandpa, not because he was a good brother and a good uncle and a good grandson, a good son, a good friend, a hard worker. He was all of those things. He was faithful and obedient to be a good steward of all the blessings that the Lord entrusted him. But we can have that assurance and that hope today for one reason and one reason only. And that's, that's that there was a time in his life when he put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ and his finished work on Calvary's cross. And so, friend, with that in mind, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I praise you and thank you for the privilege and honor of having known Mr. Donald Roy. God, I thank you that he was a part of my life, a person who was in my life, someone that I had opportunity to visit and fellowship with over the years. Father, I thank you that he raised a son that would ultimately lead me to your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for your blessings on this family, for the love that is so great, for the legacy Lord God, of this patriarch that we memorialize today. And I pray, Lord, that you take that example that he's given us, an example that's worthy to follow. And, Lord, that you speak through us. God, I lift up the family to you. I lift up Penny as she comes to speak of her dad. Lord, I pray your blessings on her. I lift up Hayden as he leads us in music. Lord, I lift up Britt as he comes to share your word. All the family, Lord, for strength. Continue to lift up Miss Joyce to you. God, I just pray that each one would experience you as the God of all peace, the God of all comfort. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. First thing that y'all may have noticed if you came by a while ago was the um, tractor in the middle of the casket spray. And uh, we tried to find the perfect one that, that matched what he had. But then when Mom and I were looking at it and discussing it with Britt and Donya, we decided it, it, it was too new and too nice and too pretty. So we thought, you know, maybe we need to knock out a back glass or uh, take a fender off or maybe even put a cow in the side of it. I don't know. It just, you know, kind of looks funny being all nice and shiny and bright on there. Um, thank you all so much for coming. When you think of DR, two things come to mind. Number one, he was one of the best mechanics around. And number two, he was a man of few words, and not necessarily in that order. Daddy always loved mechanicking and welding on things. Vehicles, big trucks, equipment, race cars, it didn't matter. Multiple times we have heard him tell someone how to overhaul some motor over the phone in detail. One time he even told me how to change out a faucet over the phone. When he went to work at Doley Hills, he was like a kid in a candy store. Daddy loved working on all that big equipment and those big dump trucks. And he was so excited when they got that big drag line. He brought home all the manuals and would study at night. 
And mom asked, isn't it new? It doesn't need fixing. He said, it will one day. And when he finally got his hands on it, he was like a kid at Christmas. I think he would have worked on it for free if he could have. But when I started driving, I was so happy to have a vehicle to drive. I would tell him any time I heard a noise on the car. And he would ask, well, was it a knocking sound? Was it a rattling sound? And we would go through the whole clank, 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 clank. Or was it a tick, 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 tick? Or was it just a knock, 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 knock sound? And after I finally got on his nerve so bad about every little detail, he finally told me, just drive it till it quits. <laughs> so I was about 15 or 16, and I left the house one day. Y'all all know where we lived on the Ashland Road. And I got as far as the highway barn, and I heard thunk, 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 thunk. And I knew I had a flat. But we didn't have cell phones back then, so I just turned around and drove it back to the house. I got back, and he said, you messed up the rim. Why didn't you just stop, stay there? I would have come and gotten you. I said, it was still going. You said, drive it till it quits. It didn't quit. But he just grinned and said, well, yeah, y'all know how he talked. But that became our phrase then, and we still say it today, just drive it till it quits. Daddy taught me how to drive a standard on back roads, and Mom taught Britt how to drive one in the hayfield. And Donya got her license, and she had her eye on a little cute black Chevy Cavalier Z24 at the Chevrolet place in town. But she wouldn't ask them for it. But unknowingly to her, they bought it for her. And Daddy takes her down there and surprises her. She's all excited. Mom's at the house with a camcorder waiting to film her driving up in the driveway in the brand new car. Donya gets in the driver's seat, and she just sits there looking all confused. Daddy says, what's the matter? She said, there is one problem. He said, ah, we can get you a different radio. Because, you know, back then she was all about the music. She said, that's not it. She said, I don't know how to drive a standard. He said, what? We never taught you to drive a standard? She said, no, sir. So Daddy comes driving up in the driveway in the brand new (laughs) Chevrolet Cavalier Z24 with Donya following behind him in Mom's gold Corsica while Mom's waiting there to film. Mom says, what's the deal? He said, the dang thing's a standard. Neither one of us ever taught her how to drive a standard. Donya said they put 100 miles on that car that day teaching her to drive. But Daddy kind of liked small things. He really never liked a big crowd or a big formal social gathering. But every year he took me to the daddy-daughter banquet we had here at our church when I was little. Now, one year he was working offshore and couldn't go, so Uncle Ivy B. took me. Mom made sure I didn't miss out. And thinking back now, I know that he would have probably rather just taken me to get a pizza instead of a big formal social gathering, but he suffered through it because it meant so much to me, and I looked forward to it so much. But he loved us with everything he had. And one time he told someone, I love all three of my children equally. But I can talk to my son and reason with him, and he usually listens and will take my advice. But when my daughters make up their mind, Katie, bar the door, because there is not one ounce of give in them. I don't know where we got that from. When Daddy got into the hay business, his first calls were to Butch and Taylor. They had worked for him before when he had the trucking company and on and off for many years. And he told them, we are back in business. We called them the -the over-the-hill gang. One day, Mom was working in the yard, and she heard Daddy pulling into the driveway in his diesel truck, pulling a trailer with a sofa on the back of it. Then she laughed when she saw Butch sitting on the sofa waving at her as they drove by. 
I can't remember where they were taking it or who they were hauling it for, but it was just funny. But of course, nothing they did surprised any of us. My boys worked for him in the summers, and I told them to soak up every minute of working with him and learn everything they could because there was not a better teacher out there. I said there isn't anything that he can't fix. And belts would break, bearings would burn up, tires would go flat, rake teeth would break. Sometimes a tractor would catch fire next to a flammable building. Where's Uncle Pogey? In Dad's infinite wisdom, he had parked the tractor next to the shed that contained all of Uncle Pogey's beaver dam explosives. The tractor caught fire, causing the shed full of explosives to catch fire. Uncle Pogey, Uncle Buntney, Richard, Daddy, I don't remember who all, but it was a family affair. We're trying to put out the fires, but also get all the explosives out of the shed. In all the commotion, Uncle Pogey's pants got caught on a nail, and he got hung up and couldn't get loose just as the whole building was about to explode. But the really funny thing that Britt and I were talking about is the only reason Daddy got into the hay business because Pogey was getting out of the hay business to trap beavers. But with Daddy, it was always something. The boys would come home and say, Papa has the patience of Job. And that was the truth. They would tell him something tore up or something wasn't working right, but he wouldn't get mad. He wouldn't get aggravated. He wouldn't show any emotion at all. Nothing phased him. He would just say, let me get my wrench. Let me get my air compressor. Let me get my welding machine. You know, just whatever it took to fix it, he would get it. Most days, it would be several things at one time, but he just kept plugging along because he loved it. He worked on that contraption, and he named it that, forever, and was so proud of himself when he finished it. It saved him so much time being able to rake and roll at the same time. The boys came home every day with a story to tell. Ty said it was best... Ty said it best when he said, Papa taught them everything there is to know about hard work and staying calm when things aren't going your way. Daddy didn't talk much, but when he did speak, he was worth hearing. He was very smart. He had a very dry wit about him. He just had the best sense of humor, but he was always thinking. You could tell. He was quiet. He was always thinking. He just didn't mix words, though. I'd call the house, and if he answered... I would say, hey, Daddy. He'd say, hey, you want your mama? I'd say, no, I want to talk to you. He'd say, all right, how are y'all? I'd say, we're good. He'd say, okay, here's your mama. (laughs) If I did ask him a question over the phone sometimes, there would be dead silence on the other end. I would say, Daddy, are you still there? Yeah, I'm thinking. And I catch myself doing that same thing on the phone when someone asks me something, but I'll say, hang on, I'm thinking. Because I don't want them to think, because I think of him, and I don't want them to think that I've just hung up. It must run in the family, though, because last night I had a question for Aunt Trudy. And I text her, and I ask, are you still up? I got a text back. She said, yes. I text Do you remember how old Daddy was when he was baptized? I had the date that he had joined this church, but I didn't have the date he was baptized. I didn't get a response from her for a while. Then I got two words from her. I'm thinking. (laughs) And I did laugh out loud for the first time in a while when I read her text. But his mother, my grandmother, Mama Pre, was the same way. She didn't talk much. And I have thought about their reunion in heaven. He probably said, hey, Mama, it's good to see you. She probably said something like, hey, Don Roy, it's good to see you too. How's everyone down there? They all right. How's everyone up here? She probably would say, everybody's good. It will probably take them 6.2 seconds to catch up on 11 years and all 12 siblings. And those of you that read the obituary should have seen that about the veterinarian assistant, that he was a jack-of-all-trades, he was even a veterinarian assistant. Donya's pride and joy 
are these two huge Dogo Argentina dogs. The female was about to have puppies. Donya made a state-of-the-art doggy nursery in her house. She rigged up a kitty swimming pool with blankets and towels for a nice, cozy delivery. She had the finest security cameras installed so that she could watch her in case she went into labor while she was at work. She was afraid the mama dog may have complications with this pregnancy. So it's Mother's Day, and Mom and Dad are coming to visit Donya. And I called to tell Donya they should be getting there any minute. But I can tell she's upset, and she's like me. We just don't cry over a whole lot. But she had been crying. She's out of breath. Come to find out, the dog has gone under the porch and is about to go into labor. And she's tried to get her out, and she can't. She's pulled off some of the siding on the porch. And she's dug a tunnel to her, and she still can't get herself and the dog out together. She said, I'm currently trying to crank the chainsaw. (laughs) And I panicked. I said, calm down. Do not crank that saw. I said, just wait. Daddy's coming. He'll fix it. Because, you know, Daddy fixed everything. Sure enough, Daddy gets there, and together they took boards off the floor of the porch and off the sides of the porch. Just more or less demolished the porch to get to this dog. But before they could get her in the house, she goes under the other side of the house. More demolition now to the other side of the house. But they got her again and finally got the dog in the house. Stephen said it took him three days to repair all the destruction the two of them created. But Sadie Dog finally had four puppies, but she did have complications. And if they had not gotten to her, they would not all have survived. Dad even had to help Donya revive one of them. Where was Mom in all this commotion, you might ask? Watching it all on the -the state-of-the-art security system monitors in the living room. (laughs) Daddy thought his grandsons hung the moon. Mom and Dad were building their house when Ty came along and Hayden was on the way. The house was not finished, but they had started on the upstairs. He was just about to start on the railings. Ty was just a baby, maybe about six months old, and I was holding him on my hip. Daddy never said a word, but he just came up and measured the top of Ty's head. I asked, why are you measuring my child's head? He said, I need to know how far apart to put those balusters so my grandsons don't fall through. But he was always looking out for them. And he was blessed to have step-grandsons, too, and he enjoyed spending time with them. He enjoyed watching Joe play ball, and Joe was lucky enough to work with them one summer. Mom and Dad looked forward to Brandon and Jay's coming to visit, and they always livened things up on the hill for a while. He tried to make as many ball games or shooting events that he could to watch his grandsons when they were in high school. He and Mom kept the road hot between Cachata and Bastrop, trying not to miss out on anything. Mom and Dad continued going to the basketball games when Ty started coaching. They didn't want to miss a thing. Any of them did. Daddy was proud of Ty and the example that he set for his players. He's proud of Hayden and his ministry. We would joke that Hayden got his musical talents from our side of the family. Knowing full well our side can't really play the radio, much less anything else. His mama does get all credit, her side of the family, for the music. He was super proud of Alex and his youth group. Alex has 90-something kids in his group, and he is steadily leading them to the Lord. Daddy would joke that Mikey decided to go into banking because of working in the hayfield with him. He wanted out of the heat, and he knew who would be needing loans by how much their equipment broke down. (laughs) So he was proud of him, too. I was thinking about Ty, Mikey, Hayden, and Alex this morning. They all four have some of his traits. Ty and Hayden both have his patience and his way of analyzing things, thinking. They are laid back. They don't get excited very easy. Alex and Mikey both have his mechanical and his engineering mind. They like working on things. They love a new tool, and they will not give up until they figure out the problem and get it running again. 
He will be extremely missed. And there are hard days ahead. There will be a hole now. On that fourth row from the back in the middle section of this church. Because that's where he and my mama would hold hands every Sunday. But his legacy will live on in his grandsons and the three of us. Thank y'all all so much for coming. Thank you, Hayden, for uh, playing. Thank you, Brother James, for helping us. Words can't express what the Hester family means to our family. Appreciate them. And Penny uh, did a good job, of course. Uh, I didn't want her to do too good of a job. I wanted to look somewhat like I knew what I was doing today. But um, I like that song, in case you don't know the answer to it. Uh, the title, it's called, It Is Well With My Soul. Yeah. And um, everything is well with Dad today. We're thankful for that. And we're thankful for all of you. We appreciate you. We thank you for your support. I don't know if anyone's been prayed for as often as dad has been prayed for as of late. And for about three weeks, my mind has been just going 90 to nothing. 24 hours a day, I'd wake up in the morning thinking about things. I would write things down. But I wanted to read a verse 
in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And I could not get away from that verse when I thought about Dad and how he treated people and how he treated family, how he treated complete strangers. Because Dad always treated people the way that the Lord would want us to treat people. Let's bow for a word of, of prayer if you would help me. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for Jesus, for loving us. We thank you for dad and 78 wonderful years. I pray, Lord, today for the congregation that has been assembled here. I pray most of all, Lord, if there's one here today, family or friend, who knows not Christ as their Savior, that they would realize that that's the greatest need in their life. I pray that you would give me the clarity of mind to speak. Uh, Lord, the future of the lost is more important than my tears at this time. So I pray that you would just use me today as your spokesman. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, I want to kind of springboard off of... um, Penny, something Penny told me, I think it was about 1995 or 6, Penny had told me that Dad, for a while, had been wanting one of the new Cummins turbo diesels that Dodge had come out with. So Dad went to Winsboro. He found the truck he wanted. The only problem was it was fire engine red. And Penny told me, she said, whatever you do, don't say anything about the color of that truck because dad had always either driven a gray truck those of you know him you know that the secret safe with me well if you'll remember and some of you will about 1996 a movie came out called twister the two stars of that movie helen hunt and bill paxton they were basically they were tornado chasers And guess what they were chasing tornadoes in? Mom and dad went through a drive-thru in South Shreveport and the young man working there uh, said, they probably went for parts or something and the young man said, oh, that looks just like that truck on Twister because that was the new movie. Of course, I'm thinking when I heard that the young man, mom told me that the young man said that, I'm thinking... Well, the Bible says the prophets were until John. So we know there are no prophets left today. But the young man in the drive through had no idea how prophetic he was. Because when my daddy got through with that truck, Ryan Dupree, it looked worse than the one that the tornado tore up on that movie. And I'm not joking with you about that. Man, <laughs> Mark told me, he said, DR was hard on a truck. He just didn't care. Um, <laughs> and uh, we, we had so many laughs and things that he did. And um, <laughs> I just, uh, I received a call the other day from uh, uh, a fellow in Center, Texas, Name is Brother Jerry Cockrell, and he called to express his uh, condolences about uh, my dad passing away. And he said something that I knew, but it was something that I needed to hear again. He said, your daddy already preached his funeral. And that's so true. He already has preached his funeral. He preached it with his life. We're just here to celebrate that life and make no mistake about it. It is a celebration indeed. I want to talk about a few things today. I want to talk about dad's heart, first of all. I want to talk about his heart. In March of 2017, I had invited dad to take a road trip with me. In hindsight, it probably wasn't the best idea. 
we left Bastrop after church on a Sunday night. Uh, we proceeded. We were to meet a man in Clinton, Illinois uh, the next day at lunch. I said, that's no problem. We can make that. I'll drive most of the way during the night. Dad can sleep. We stopped at the Western Sizzlin in Monticello, Arkansas and ate supper. And by the time we got to Stuttgart, Dad was having some serious problems. Man, he was sick, sick, sick. And I finally, I finally said, well, Dad, are you having, I didn't know what was going on. I said, Dad, are you having a heart attack? And you know how daddy would always say, oh, you know, that was, I don't know if you can find that word in the dictionary, uh, but that was his word. Oh, <laughs> he said, oh, he said, I'm all right. He said, I got a good heart. Something else is going on. Well, he was having the gallbladder attack, <laughs> but he said, oh, I got a good heart. And I thought about that. I said, I'm going to build his funeral sermon around that phrase. I've got a good heart. No truer words were spoken than what my dad said that night around Stuttgart, Arkansas. I've got a good heart. Those of us that know him, we saw that good heart uh, in action so, so many times. And the stories are still coming in. Things that he's done that we didn't know that he did. We cherish all of them. Uh, his words were, were so important to me. Uh, such a good-hearted person. Always willing to give someone a job. Everyone that met him loved him completely selfless, completely selfish, selfless. I was telling my brother-in-law that, that uh, I was telling John, I said, you know, dad would, do, dad would do hay jobs for people. And when you started putting the pen to the paper, the, the yield that was there and the, the time it took and the fuel that was burned, he wouldn't make any money. But you know what? He would do it because those people had a few cows or a few horses that had to be fed. So dad was always willing to go above and beyond. Uh, he was going to see to it. He, dad could not say no. Um, one time in the winter, uh, I remember I was still living in Arkansas. And it was before cell phones had really gotten popular. And the ground was already bad for some of my own cows and and the ground was rotten. It was the dead of winter. It was a day. It, and we were trying to get the cows fed before the rain got there. The front was coming. And I'm talking about the bottom just fell out. And I just had this sinking despair came over me. We couldn't even hardly get the hay trailers out of the field with trucks while they were empty. And I thought, there's no way we're going to go back in when, with them loaded and right there across from where Jerry Sally built that basketball camp, uh, I look there, and I'm coming down 371, raining, you can't hardly see. And there comes Dad coming out of that road where we had our hay staged. A uh, 40-foot trailer of hay just loaded to the max, the windshield wiper on. Dad just came out of that dirt road, hit 371, never missed a leak. And I thought once again, you know, Dad could just fix anything. There was nothing that he was going to come up against. Uh, he was going to make it better. He was going to fix it. Um, <laughs> you know, he just, he never ceased to impress me with what, how he could always, he could put your nerves at ease. Uh, we, we knew something might happen to Dad one day, but we knew he'd never have a heart attack from stress. I mean, that... That just wasn't going to happen. He, he just wasn't, he wasn't going to worry about it. Uh, you just couldn't hardly get him upset. And I would get worried about things. Well, we'll even have enough. Oh, it'll be all right. Uh, and he was right. Uh, one day we were out at uh, Indian Mitchell's at the Pine Tree Ranch. And Dad was rolling hay. I don't remember what he was working on. But he pulled so hard that he pulled the bicep off, loose from the bone on his forearm. He pulled his bicep off. And his, and his bicep just wadded up like that. And he, Inyard came out there and he, he said, uh, he said, well, I think I might have hurt my arm. And Inyard looked at his arm. He said, yeah, D.R., I don't think it's supposed to look like that. <laughs> I mean, the bicep is, is up here. Yeah, I'll get that checked out. He went and got back on the tractor and finished rolling hay. I mean, it, it, I saw him flatten out his hand with sledgehammers. I mean, it was just, it was just amazing what he could do. He was so 
determined. He just, he just had that determination. I saw him do things that were unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> and I want to talk not only about his heart, but I want to talk a little bit about his humor. Now see, Dad never really tried to be funny, but oh, he was. He wouldn't try to be funny. Uh, he never really tried to be funny. Uh, when he had the uh, penny, my sister made mention of the trucking company. Well, we had a con man. I don't know if he came out of Shreveport or where he came from. A dude came by the trucking company. Uh, where's Butch at? Butch, stick your hand up in there. Butch worked for my dad, with my dad for 50 years. For 50 years. And I don't know if you were there that day, but a guy came by the trucking company and sold dad some soap for the, for the uh, you remember it, don't you? Okay, so this con man comes by the trucking company and he sells a drum of soap for the steam cleaner. Okay, John Mark Bamberg, I think. John Mark, after dad writes a guy a check, dude's gone, they unload. John Mark comes run up to dad. DR, DR, what are we going to do? That dude sold us a drum of water. He said, all it is is water. It's, it's not soap. And he was pretty disturbed about it. He being John Mark. Dad said, oh, that's all right. I figured he would, so I wrote him a hot check. <laughs> hey, hey, we're in the church house, and that's the truth. That's the truth. He wrote, it, he wrote that dude a hot check. Hot check for a barrel of water. It's a good sermon title there, ain't it? Yeah, he fixed him. <laughs> you wasn't going to get much over on him. Um, <laughs> that, tractor that, that was, that tractor that we torched, you know, I'm pretty sure now that he's gone we can say this. And the insurance already paid for it. But I'm pretty sure that tractor ignited because of some of his modifications. <laughs> and I think Ryan will probably back me up on that and Mark because... Dad would mess, mess with things should have been left alone. Well, not only did he have some modifications made, he topped that tank off with diesel fuel that night right before it caught. So, I mean, when it, when it, it had a lot to burn. Well, so the hay tractor is gone. So, me and a friend, we get on the internet. I said, Dad, I found your tractor. I think it's going to be a good one. The only problem is it's in Salina, Kansas. So, uh... We grabbed Mark's trailer, me and Dad. We, we left. He got off the mine at 7 o'clock in the morning. We hooked up. We headed from Cushada to Salina, Kansas. Got there almost at dark. Looked at the tractor. He liked the tractor. Checked in the hotel. Couldn't get the tractor that day because the place was closed. Looked at it after hours. We got there. We, he ran the tractor. We, we started, you know, talking to a little guy. Well, the seat was messed up in the tractor. It wouldn't go up and down, and it wouldn't turn. Well, they, they, Dad said, look, I, I can't, we got to have that seat a roll hay. You know, we can't have a seat that's froze up. The guy said, okay, I'll, I'll get you a seat. Well, Dad found some other stuff he wanted. Well, the little boy had given us his life history. He started out weed-eating at the, at the tractor dealership. Well, he worked his way up to salesman, and we're standing there, and I'm at the counter, and Dad's propped up on the counter, uh, and the little boy's got his ad machine. This was in 2008. And he's adding it up, and he's, he's coming up, and he's throwing in the price of the seat. And I thought, there's fixing to be a little problem here. <laughs> and uh, he's telling, well, this is going to be this. And Dad, I'm, I'm not lying with the Lord's moment. Dad never looked at it. The little boy was right here. Dad's propped up. Dad's looking off at something. He takes that big hand. He said, hey, he said, ho, ho, ho. He said, you're going the wrong way. He said, you're going up. He said, you need to be going down. You, going, you need to be going down. And I wish I would have had a camera to take a picture of that little salesman's face. Dad said, you're going up on the price. You need to be going down. So, sooner, so he started going down. And, uh, <laughs> and we, we come home. We blew out about three tires in Oklahoma City. The heat index was 110 and uh, it, we just always had, I was almost scared to take him anywhere because there was going to be something. Uh, but, you know, he just, uh, he was so funny. And he didn't even try to be funny. And I know you could all come up with things. Mama banned him 
from watching swamp people. <laughs> no, now listen to me. This also really happened. Man, so Dad would watch swamp people. And you've seen the show. Now, people that shoot alligators know that's all Hollywood. They just float up the boat and you shoot them. Well, on there, James, they got to make them flop. And, you know, you got to have something. I mean, it's pretty boring the way you really shoot an alligator. So they bring them up and alligators doing this. And Troy Landry saying, shoot them, shoot them. And DR is sitting there watching this. Well, when he goes to night, he starts having his night terrors. And flailing around in the bed and hitting mama and, you know, just fighting alligators. Well, she made him quit watching swamp people. Well, <laughs> she banned him for that. I guess after 58 years, you have the right to ban somebody from watching something. Well, so one night, Dad elbows Mom in the ribs. She said pretty hard. Of course, that wakes her out of her sleep. Well, I think she let that one slide. She elbowed him a second. He elbowed her a second time in the ribs. And then he ended up elbowing her a third time. About that time, I think she was ready to get him. And she said, DR, what are you doing? He dude was sound asleep. He said, I'm trying to crank my saw. <laughs> While he was asleep. <laughs> dude never tried to be funny. He never tried to be funny. Uh, Penny, you remember this one? I don't know if it was a trooper. Dad got pulled over. I don't know if he was in a big truck. And the, and the police had shot him with a radar gun. And... Uh, while the dude was looking over the truck, Dad eased back to the cop car, reached in, and reset the radar. <laughs> you remember that? He sure did. Now, I don't know if it was DOTD. I don't know who it was. He reset the, he reset the radar. Well, when little dude gets through doing his walk around and all that, he, Dad said, now, how fast did you say I was going? Well, he told him again. Dad said, well, I'd like to see that. He said, okay. He walked back there, radar gun, zero. <laughs> I'm not lying. Dude got out of a ticket. He told me that. He said, I... I <laughs> he also told me that he took out some, uh, some of them railroad things over around Kilgore one time because it came down on his truck and he just, he just kept going. Uh, he wasn't worried about it. I can promise you that. Uh, <laughs> you know, I told Mark this. Some of these know this. I, I don't know if Tater Smith's here or not, but Dad said it could have been Tater but somebody parked one of those tractors that the mine had, those 7,000 series John Deere. Somebody had parked one right behind the motor grader Daddy was operating. They had eaten lunch. Daddy got back on the motor grader, put it in reverse, and destroyed the front of that tractor. Dad said, well, the ripper was raised all the way up. He said it had a big old counterweight on it. He said, but when it hit the counter, when the ripper hit the counterweight, it didn't just slide the tractor. It jumped up over the counterweight. And just took the radiator out, the hood, the lights, just destroyed. And I said, well, Dad, how did you do that? He said, well, I didn't do my walk around before I, I cranked back up. And I said, well, didn't your mirrors, you know, what? I, I was trying to figure this out. I said, well, what about your mirrors? He said, oh, he said, after I hit it, I looked in that mirror and there wasn't nothing but green <laughs> in that mirror. <laughs> he just didn't pay attention. <laughs> and the coal mine stories are just unlimited. Uh, <laughs> forgot, his, forgot his clip one day on the back tire of a tractor and clipped it on there and went to peddling. Blew up a perfectly good tractor tire. Just, just blew it up. Wasn't paying attention. <laughs> he said, I said, what's that new tire? Oh, I forgot. I, I had that thing clipped on there. Um, you know, he just uh, took everything with a grain of salt. We have so many laughs, and we'll be laughing for years just thinking about things that he did. I'm on a, I want to close by talking about his spirituality. The reality is Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Every little boy wants to be or wants to impress their dad. Every little boy. That's just something I believe that's born in, in a little boy. You want to impress your dad. I guess it was about the fifth or sixth grade. And I had a boy at the school that was giving me a little, little trouble. And uh, I, let it, I let it rock on for a while. And one day on the playground, I just popped him right in the jaw. And I stopped that. 
And uh, I did. I, I kind of surprised myself. I, I don't think that was a dupe. I think that was a penny that came out in me there. <laughs> I, just, I just put up with it as long as I was going to put up with it. I popped him. But here's what happened. That took care of the bullying. Well, I get home that day. And I ain't going to lie. I, told, I went to my dad and I said, you know, that boy was giving me. I said, I popped him right in the jaw. And I was waiting for the praise of my dad. And I didn't get it. See, he didn't want me being like that. And I thought that he was going to, to praise me. Now, now, that was great that he did not. Because I'm going to tell you, lesser men, lesser men would have encouraged that kind of behavior out of their sons. He, he did the right thing. He did the right thing. You know, the time came in 1990, I accepted the Lord. In 1992, I surrendered to preach. And in 1993, the time came for me to leave home and go preach in Arkansas. I thought about lesser men. I said, lesser men would have said, son, stay here. I need you to help me. But dad... Not being a lesser man, being a greater man, a spiritually minded man, was more than happy than to turn me loose and to let me go be about the Father's business. Yeah. And I appreciate that in hindsight so much. One time Dad had a co-worker at the mine. I can't remember, I really can't remember, I think it was Thanksgiving Day. And the, the guy, Dad worked with him. I, I get to the house. My children were small. Sharon and I get to the house for Thanksgiving. There's a guy at the house. Didn't know who he was. Didn't know him from Adam. And uh, so I found out a little bit more. He was a guy that worked with Dad. And he was having a pretty tough time, you know, going through some... And dad basically said he didn't have anywhere to go for the holidays. So he was going to come to our house. And he let him come in. I mean, he, he was just like one of us. But here's what dad said. Now I want you to stay with me. We're almost done here. Dad said, I knew if I brought him to the house, Britt would preach to him. And he needed to be preached to. So I'm going to use that to, to wrap this up. Maybe he brought you here today. Maybe that's why you're here. Dad would talk to people at the mine about the Lord. and He would talk to people. He'd let you know he wasn't a preacher. He wanted me to preach. He would want me to preach to all of you. That at nine years old he was saying. Out here at Bethel at Martin. But in 1953 they didn't have a baptistry out there. So Aunt Trudy drove him down here. And dad was. Now think about this now. Here we are the year 2022. In 1953. Dad was baptized right back there in 1953. That's amazing, isn't it? And I thought about that. And I thought about what would a man like Dad want me to tell you? I won't go any further with funny stories. There's plenty more. But the point is... If the Lord doesn't come back soon, there could be a casket waiting for you. And we must consider. The Bible says, consider your ways. You know what people have told me over and over again? I've heard this, and I don't get tired of hearing it. I'm not complaining. People talk about what a good man dad was. They talk about that. Well, let me tell you why he was a good man. Because of another man. Who came to this earth and lived a sinless life. And as a nine-year-old boy, my daddy accepted that man in his heart. And that man's name was Jesus. That's why 
He was the way that he was. Because of Jesus. He was the best man in my wedding. Man, I've, most of my groomsmen are here today. I was having a little fun before the service. I said, you know, my dad was my best man in my wedding. Stephen was in my wedding. Chad was in my wedding. David Jones was in my wedding. Uh, but I was thinking about, and I, had a, I was blessed with a lot of friends, and I appreciate those of you that are here that I've known most of my life. Uh, I appreciate you more than I know. My heart comes to Cushada three or four times a day just thinking about things. And I thought about when the time came in 1993 for me to get married, I didn't have to sit down and scratch my head and think about it. I knew one thing. My daddy would be the best man in my way. And he was. Because as far as man's definition goes, he was the best man that I knew. And I love my daddy. And I'm so thankful for my daddy. He was my hero. He was the one that could always fix it. He was the one you could go to. He was the one who, if there was a problem, he'd figure it out. Now, he may not figure it out as quickly as you'd like for him to figure it out. But he would figure it out. And I think about those of you that have known my daddy longer than I have. And there are some of you here. There are you, I mean, people like Mr. Terrell that grew up with him and uh, known him longer than me. I mean, the, the list just goes on and on. His brother's. I can tell you this. Some of us in this building will see him again. Amen. We will. You say, boy, I'd like to see DR again. Well, folks, you can. You can. You can see him again. Let me tell you something. You can not only see him again, you can be with him again. Throughout all eternity. I would hope that you would at least consider my appeal to you. Know that you're saved. That, folks, that's what matters at the end of the day. There's so much about the world you can't be certain of. There's so much about the world you can't control. There's so much about the world you can't know. You can know Jesus. You can know that you're saved. And you can go that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. When dad passed away the other day, one of the nurses commented, she said, he has a real peaceful look on his face. Well, I'm going to tell you why. Because of that man. Jesus. See, when you die in the Lord, you can die with peace. You say, well, it's too late for me, preacher, because I've, I've done this and I've done that. And listen, it's never too late. Anybody here that's never been saved can be saved. See, daddy didn't go to heaven because he was a good man. He went to heaven because he was a saved man. That's why he's there today. And that's why I'm going to see him again. I beg you today. I thank you first of all for showing your respect to my dad. He loved so many people. But I beg you today. Accept Jesus. Nothing is more important in your life. Than being saved. We love you dad. The parts houses can take a little break. Your labor is done. Now he's with the Lord. Yeah, Folks, we're all getting older. Yeah. Don't you think it's important for us to make sure we know where we're going when we die? Yeah, you better believe it is. 
When I say amen to this prayer, the funeral home's going to take back over. Bow with me if you would. Father, we thank you for Jesus, and I thank you for the best dad I could have had. I thank you for the selflessness that he displayed and the way that he just was so willing to help, and not just for my family, but Lord, others that he knew as well. And I know, Lord, you're going to give my mama the grace to get through this and my sisters. And Lord, we know that your grace has gotten us this far. I praise you, Lord, for every friend that I have that's here, every family member, every person that made the trip to show support. Bless them as they return to their respected homes. We thank you. We do love you. And Lord, we know that one day, because of Jesus, we can begin a reunion that will never end. We pray in his precious name. Amen.